I'd like to thank Greg and Linda and the department at University of Washington for inviting me here. It's, it's a sincere honor. Um, a lot of the data and evidence base and meta-analysis and all that stuff, I'm not going to cover because it's just for the second time. It's in your syllabus. So I'm happy to take any questions about it during the break or, or feel free to email me. But just know that that's in there and everything I say aren't just, it's just not my musings, but there's the, the best possible. I've tried to put some um, evidence behind it. So um, first thing it's important to know when you're talking about the use of a balloon or any surgical tool that uh, what we're trying to accomplish in surgery depends on the disease process. Clearly, these are not the same disease. And um, so from that standpoint, the use of the balloon or any device, like I said, is, is going to depend on what the, the surgical goals are. Are you just trying to make or enlarge holes? Uh, are you trying to remove fluid or, or debris, such as that, that uh, eosinophilic mucin? Or is the primary goal of the surgery including the need to resect tissue? Um, clearly, there's things from, from that perspective that the balloon does and does not do. And I, I think we can pretty much agree on, on these. Uh, so what are the applications of the balloon? I, I generally see this in, in three categories. Uh, you have your balloon alone procedures, hybrid procedures where you're doing a FESS and using a balloon as a finding device, and then, uh, then using the balloon for salvage. So in those three categories. Um, the balloon alone uh, is, is paradoxically something that I think is more difficult than doing it as a hybrid or as a salvage, especially in a virgin patient. Uh, and, but the indications for it also, I think, are a lot, a lot slimmer uh, than, than the current applications would, would be, um, at least in my practice, because uh, these occasional patients that have uh, surgery with minimal CT disease but, but positive uh, symptoms, um, that, that might be one case why you would want to do a balloon alone procedure. Uh, an, an, another is the, the occasional rare true barosinusitis. Uh, that's more common in divers, sometimes people who fly a lot, but barosinusitis really just isn't that common. And then isolated frontal disease. Uh, even then, a balloon alone procedure might be insufficient uh, if what's inside the sinus that needs to be drained is very viscous, but theoretically that, that's an application. Uh, more often than not, when I use a balloon, it's for one of those other two applications, either uh, when I'm doing a FESS and I've used the balloon as a, as a finding device to localize and dilate that tract, after which I'll go back with uh, conventional instrumentation, microdebrider, et cetera, to remove polyps or remove um, displaced bone fragments. Or my other common application of it is for salvaging a stenosing frontal sinusotomy, and I'll show you examples of that. So this is an example of one of these patients. Let's say, I mean, obviously you see the um, mucosal thickening in the ethmoids and some dependent disease in, in the maxillaries. Uh, but uh, looking at that sagittal image, here there's an opacification in an agarnazi cell, a couple frontal recess cells. Here you have a frontal bullar cell. Uh, let's say this patient had frontal headaches. Uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's quite debatable whether a patient who has clear frontals but has frontal headaches, whether those headaches are indeed cyanogenic. Uh, the, the CT findings don't correlate in that situation with, with um, the disease in the sense that the frontals themselves were, were, were well aerated. Uh, then again, it's also possible that, that there may be some uh, uh, barometric effect of having disease in the recess that then uh, gives the patient headaches. But there's, there's no acid test to know whether that patient's headaches are, are indeed cyanogenic. And so the, uh, surgery in a situation like that, especially when the severity of the symptoms might be out of proportion to, the, to those radiologic findings, you know, the surgery is controversial. And I, I think in these patients, it, it, it's important to counsel them that, well, we're doing surgery for your congestion, your headaches. You know, I, I'm going to address your frontals with a balloon. Um, your headaches may or may not get better. Um, other patients that have more clear-cut neurologic conditions like photo associated uh, headaches associated with photophobia or with nausea, vomiting, or they have auras. Um, and those patients, I, I think it, it's incumbent on you to uh, refer that patient to a neurologist. And if the headache's really what the patient's there for, then uh, that, that patient probably needs uh, workup or imaging or, or um, empiric trials of, of migraine therapies, et cetera, before you even operate the patient. Uh, so th this is a nice study that's quoted a lot. It's about 3,000 patients who present with a, a sinus headache. Well, lo and behold, most of them, almost all of them actually, fulfill the IHS criteria for a, for a migraine. Um, so I think before operating on these patients where the primary complaint is headache, it's important to think about that. Um, so I'm going to move on and spend most of the time on the technical considerations. That um, salvaging a frontal sinusotomy, this is a very nice um, role of the balloon that, uh, let's say this is a patient that you operated on two years ago, you follow this patient in the office every three months, uh, 
periodically and progressively, you're seeing gradual uh, stenosis of this cicatricially. Uh, every time this, this lady gets a, a cold or an allergic exacerbation, she gets a headache. Wouldn't surprise you that some inflammation in that already pinpoint opening is going to cause it to close off and become symptomatic. Uh, this is a great use of a balloon to salvage. Um, this, this, you know, nowadays, we don't use fluoroscopy anymore. Uh, the, the guide wire and the light are, um, or the probe and the light are, are very uh, useful confirmatory tactics, but you, you almost don't even need that. You know where this hole is. You've been following it every three months for two years. So this is an example here, a similar, very similar case, um, not the same one, the middle turbinate, left side, um, lateral nasal wall. There you see that small opening. Um, it, the probe with the light and the guide wire is going to go up there. Um, you all, again, almost don't need it, but I'm going to stop this video here. But it's one important thing is that when you are using light as your confirmation, uh, the, the light, if, it, if the probe or the wire is not in the sinus, you will just see this sort of general hue of, of red or orange warmth in the brow. In that situation, again, you're not in the sinus. What, what you want to see is this dancing point of light. It's bright. It's specific. Um, it, it is a much more um, uh, sensitive sign when that point is actually seen. And then the balloon can easily be, be threaded over that. And um, you know what, this particular patient, I, I think I was doing a turbinate reduction or something. I did it in the OR. But you can see how um, this could very easily be, be done in the clinic, especially when you know where that hole is. There's no anatomy in the way. Um, a lot of these patients, because they've had FEST before, they're, they're, they're pretty uh, accepting of office procedures. And, and then after I suck the blood away, you, you'll look into that outflow tract there, and you see the, the, the difference that we've achieved. You know, one, one sort of soft point here is that uh, you can see why this frontal was prone to failure, because uh, posterior and lateral to the frontal itself is this um, superorbital ethmoid air cell or this, or this um, space here. Um, and you can see this partition was left uh, between the anterior part of the, the superorbital ethmoid air cell and, and the frontal proper, which is going to be uh, more anterior and, and medial to that. Uh, if you're in the operating room and you feel like you can take that down without stripping mucosa out of the recess, it's a, that's another perfectly legitimate maneuver to make after you've done this with a balloon. Um, or you can leave it there, depending on your, your discretion. Um, this is another example. This is actually the first one I showed you. See, this is a simple pre and post dilation. This was done in the office. Uh, what's going on back here? Clearly, there's some adhesion between the turbinate and the lateral nasal wall, um, the lamina. Uh, this could be osteotic bridging. Uh, you know, I don't know just from that image. Uh, this might stay open three months. It might stay open a year. It might stay open indefinitely. I don't know. Um, this, this right here might be a nidus for uh, recurrent inflammation and stenosis. I don't know. But some of these patients, um, they're, they're, they'd much rather come be dilated in the office once a year than go back to surgery and go under anesthesia and, and take time off work and pay deductibles and, and co-pays and all that stuff. So this is a perfectly legitimate management strategy in, in a patient like this. Um, you also have to think why this might not work. And I think Zara touched on this. Um, here, this is a nice example of why uh, frontals fail. Um, here, you, the crosshair is there on the sagittal or in, in a super buller cell. Uh, and you, the, the frontal always is going to drain anterior to the anterior partition of that cell and posterior to the Agarnazi cell. But there you see there is this um, dense osteotic bridging where those two leaves kiss each other. And um, it, you might find a lot of difficulty passing a probe or a guide wire through that. Uh, another example of where this balloon dilation alone might be insufficient. Another um, stereotypical cause of failure, the crosshairs there are on the anterior face of a super buller cell. Here you see the residual cap of an Agonazi cell. The outflow tract would be about right there where those two leaves kiss each other. It would probably be pretty easy to get a guide wire through here because that doesn't look very um, osteotic. But what you have and what you see there in the endoscopic view is polyps. And um, it's not going to do very much good to just spread and push those polyps apart because they'll just swell back together 12 hours later. And so in this situation, even though the balloon might be a good finding tool to, to cannulate and dilate that outflow tract to see it, uh, management of, of this problem requires removal of that inflammatory burden in the way of doing polyp um, resection from the recess. Um, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about use in the virgin frontal. Uh, the use in a virgin frontal, as I alluded to previously, it's, it's actually and paradoxically more difficult, especially when you do it in the office. 
these are not patients that are used to getting stuff stuck up their noses. Um, there's also stuff in the way. The uncinate's still there. The bullet's still there. Um, and so it, I think this actually takes more technical finesse than doing a, a, the salvages and, and revisions that I showed you. Um, it's also important to know that the balloon, it's not, it's not a hunt and peck or a fishing tool. It, it, you really, to do this properly, you really need to understand the anatomy the same way you need to, to do a conventional frontal sinusotomy. Because if you put that guide wire or inflate that balloon in the wrong place, it actually can create problems. And I, I think that's a pretty unrecognized, undiscussed um, side effect of improper balloon use. And I'll illustrate that for you. Um, so one thing you see commonly is when that guide wire is placed in a false passage. Very simple schematic diagram that if that guide wire and then the balloon is placed in a submucosal space, in other words, if it lifts the muca periosteum off of the bony walls of the sinus, and then when you inflate the balloon, it's actually going to close the sinus because it's going to push a flap of mucosa into the outflow tract. Uh, similarly, um, if that balloon and guide wire are sitting in the agar nasi cell and you inflate the balloon in an agar nasi cell, it will close off the frontal sinus because what it will do is it will blow out that cell. It will sublux that cell into the recess. Uh, when the balloon is here, these are situations where you don't see that nice point of transluminated dancing light like I showed you in the video. And instead, the forehead just sort of warms up with this um, red or orange hue. You're not in the frontal sinus in the vast majority of those cases. Uh, so understanding the anatomy. I, this, I, I love this diagram. I, I use it all the time. I color things in on it. Those are my lines. And this is, this is showing you essentially what you're doing during functional endoscopic sinus surgery. We're, we're staying low as we go through those, those uh, parallel coronal Messerklinger landmarks of the uncinate, the bullar face, the basal lamella into the sphenoid. Then we go from posterior to anterior along the skull base to resect partitions and inflammatory disease. Um, for the frontal, what matters is where, um, where we are here, that the frontal always drains anterior to the face of the bulla and suprabullar cell and posterior to the agonizing and frontal recess cell complex. Uh, it's worth talking about for just a second what exactly is going on here. And Zara alluded to this, that uh, these cells here are pneumatizations of the ethmoid air cell system into the lacrimal bone. Um, they are derivatives of the first ethmo terminal. Now, if that all, if you if that just gave you a headache, just remember that, ignore the word ethmo terminal, and just remember that these cells here and the uncinate process are embryologically related entities, um, and that will come up again later. Uh, a lot of this nomenclature about these frontal recess cells or so called Kuhn cells is kind of. Um, arbitrary, but what matters is, is that they're always on the anterior aspect of the frontal outflow tract. Uh, th these frontal cells are essentially just duplications of the Agarnazi cell. By convention, we call the lowest of them the Agarnazi cell, whereas the ones above it are various types of frontal recess cells. But you might hear me refer to them as that this whole area is the Agarnazi cell complex or the frontal recess cell complex. Those are virtually synonymous. And the space you're looking for is where you see the yellow line. Um, that's a nice example here where on the sagittal you have the Agarnazi cell, you have, I guess you'd call that a type 3 frontal recess cell. This is the outflow tract of that sinus is difficult to find. It's that dotted red line and it is over the top of that frontal recess cell. It is quite closely juxtaposed to the inflection point of the skull base where you would see the rising tide that, that um, Zara showed you. And very frequently um, without the use of navigation or that light confirmation, you might be in that A cell or that F cell and think that you are in the frontal sinus, whereas really the, the sinus and the tract are up above that and uh, posterior and literally almost juxtaposed to the inflection point of the skull base. This is a very nice example also of where that guide wire can find that tract for you if you know where to introduce it. Um, this is another example here that uh, that, that suprabullar cell that I referenced previously that when that cell pneumatizes anterior and lateral into the orbital process of the frontal bone, it becomes a supraorbital ethmoid cell. Uh, the, that is also in, similar to that video I showed you earlier, that that cell is going to open uh, posterior and lateral to the frontal outflow tract proper, which is therefore anterior and medial. Um, the anterior ethmoid artery is at the posterior aspect of that, of that suprabullar recess, and it curves more anteriorly the more medial it gets. Uh, it's an example of that superorbital ethmoid air cell. If you just looked at that coronal image, you wouldn't necessarily know whether that is a loculation in a lateral compartment of a frontal or not. But uh, 
clearly when you look at the um, axial image, you can see just how posterior and lateral that is and where it is expanded into the orbital plate of the, of the frontal bone. Um, we've talked about this. And, and Andy and, and Zara both brought up these attachment types of the uncinate. Uh, we talk about this all the time. The A configuration is most common. Um, we touched on why that's important, but I hope you understand a little bit more um, when I draw in the Agarnazi cell. So uh, as I said, the uncinate process and that Agarnazi cell complex are embryologically related entities. In fact, the superior terminus of the uncinate process becomes the medial hemisphere of the Agarnazi cell. And that's most obvious in that A-type configuration. Uh, but that there are times where that uncinate can, uh, attaches, uh, where the actual very terminus of that uncinate can attach to various points on the skull base. So why does all this matter? That in that A-conformation, when the uncinate process is terminating on the orbit as the medial hemisphere of the Agarnazi cell, the frontal will drain directly into the middle meatus. And the osteum, where you look for it, will appear or feel medial in the meatus. In those other two conformations, the outflow tract of the frontal does not drain into the middle meatus, but drains into the infundibulum. And uh, where it drains is going to seem somewhat more posterior in addition to medial, because it has to drain from behind the Agarnazi cell. Um, what does that mean when you're looking for this um, with, your, with your balloon probe? You need to generally look uh, medial, and your trajectory goes from, from medial to lateral, and uh, start posterior and work anterior. So you're, so you're starting posterior and medial. You're working in, um, from there anterior laterally. Um, this is a, just a nice video here that shows that. This is the residual uncinate process. There is the balloon probe going uh, posterior and, and, and medial. Uh, that, that wired, looking forward in the forehead, again, it's important to see the, the point of dancing light. As you manipulate the guide wire, you should see that um, going around there. Um, and then threading the balloon over that. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, the, the balloon companies don't like this, but sometimes I inflate the thing fully and just pull it out inflated. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll do it, I'll bury the balloon, inflate it, count to five Mississippis, um, and then pull it back halfway so that the balloon is now straddling the part of the, the sinusotomy near the uncinate, and then I'll inflate it again. Um, so there, there's no necessarily one way, one way to do that. I don't know. I, in the South, we count Mississippis. I don't know what you guys do here. Um, so um, I'm going to just end with some uh, t talk about the maxillary. I don't use the balloon for the maxillary much. I'll try to demonstrate it. Maybe you guys, I'm sure half the people in this room have done it on the maxillary more than I have. But uh, this image shows something I think very important. So obviously a patient had surgery before. Uh, but the maxillary entrostomy was done in the wrong space. This patient has had a posterior fontanellotomy. Uh, the actual natural osteum is, is up here. And this picture nicely illustrates how the posterior fontanelle sits in a sagittal plane. The natural osteum of the maxillary sinus, though, because the infundibulum goes down that away towards 4 o'clock or 7 o'clock, uh, or 5 or 7 o'clock, that the, um, the natural osteum sits at that 45 degree angle. And that's when, when important, because when you're doing a balloon, it is critical to use either a, a sheath introducer or, a, or a, if you're using a malleable probe, whatever balloon system you're using, it is important to understand that you need to angulate that to 135 degrees because that osteum goes down at a 45 degree angle. Um, and I maybe we'll be able to illustrate that in a cadaver. Um, with that, I'd like to close. You know, we, and, uh, my partner, George Wana, and I thought we were really smart by putting together a, a course that integrates otology and rhinology. It turns out Greg thought of that already. But ours is in the south, so if you want to come, it's, it's nice and swampy hot in Nashville in July. Um, great music scene. And um, I'd also like you all to think about coming to the American Rhinologic Society Summer Science Symposium. Thanks again, Greg. Mm -hmm.